So, we need to understand that why that we do not directly get the equilibrium precipitate theta, but we go through a complex sequence of precipitation which involves uh, intermediate metastable phases like theta double prime and theta prime. And before that we have the G p zones which are copper rich zones which technically do not come under the class of precipitates, but more like enrichment regions within the matrix of copper which have a low interfacial energy. We should note that the equilibrium theta phase has a complex tetragonal crystal structure which is incoherent interfaces. So, we will come to that in a moment. These zones minimize their strain energy by choosing a disc shape with a perpendicular to the disc being along the elastically softer 110 directions of the FCC matrix. That means, the elastic energy is minimized by choosing such an orientation of the disc. The most important point to note that the driving force for this is less than the is less, but the barrier to nucleation is even much less. That means, that we put up these metastable phases or metastable uh, copper rich zone G p zone in this case, which does not give us much delta G benefit, but the overall barrier activation barrier to their nucleation is less. These G p zones are about 2 atomic layers thick and about 10 nanometer in diameter and typically they are spaced at about 10 nanometer when they initially form. And these zones seem to be homogeneously nucleated, though excess vacancies if they are present in the matrix seem to play an important role and we have noted before the quenching process actually gives us an excess vacancy concentration. So, you can see here suppose I consider this the half picture of the G p zone that means, that the G p zone itself extends the other way about this is say the mirror plane the mid plane and this is my disc of copper atoms right in the middle here and this is what we call the G p zone and uh, this is a copper rich zone and as I said this can be thought of as a precursor to a precipitate. And if you look at the way they are present in the matrix, these thin copper layers, which we pointed out can be about 2 atomic layers thick, but in the schematic below it is only 1 atomic layer is shown. You can see that they, they are present in 2 directions, which are perpendicular. So, this is the perpendicular to the disk direction. And if you look at the bright field image of such a region containing these G p zones, then you would note that it is dominated by the strain contrast. So, you have of course, the region where you expect the G p zones to be present like here, this is now the disc copper atoms the G p zones here and here, but around this you find certain dark contrast, then this dark and bright contrast is coming from the strain fields and therefore, you could be thinking that we are actually imaging the strain fields in the bright field image. If you look at the selected area diffraction pattern, apart from the diffraction spots which is coming from the matrix, these are all coming from the aluminum, of course, the aluminum copper alloy but additionally there are some streaks which you can be observed. So, there are streaks joining these spots like here, here and these streaks are coming from the fact that now my Brax condition has been relaxed perpendicular to these zones. That means, if the G p zones are thin in this direction, so they are constrained in real space. So, they tend to expand in reciprocal space along these two directions. That means, one direction coming from these kind of orientations, the other direction coming from these kind of orientations and therefore, you can see that two kinds of streaks are produced one coming from these vertical ones and the streak is in this direction and the other streak is coming in the vertical direction. So, therefore, there is a distinct signature of these G p zones in two forms one in the selected area diffraction pattern where you observe that there are streaks and one in the bright field image where not only you see that <coughs> there are uh, you can get some contrast from the uh, presence of these G p zones, but additionally the strain field surrounding the G p zones is also imaged. And uh, this can also be seen in the schematic here that now the lattice planes, which are you know going straight here, are curved around this precipitate. That means, the straight lattice planes have been curved around this G p zone region, and therefore, there is considerable strain around the lattice wherever there is a copper enrichment forming these G p zones. Now, originally before the G p zones form, you can notice that the aluminum matrix, for instance, had a four fold axis of symmetry here. So, this is my four fold down I am looking down on the four fold axis. Now, and on the formation of the G p zones this uh, symmetry is broken, but the symmetry is broken such that you get two orientations of the G p zones orientation one and orientation 2 
and the and if you put together these two orientations the combined symmetry of these orientations is the four fold. That means that there was originally a four fold and then when the G P zones came out there were two orientations orientation 1 and orientation 2 such that the combined symmetry of these two orientations gives us back the original fourfold. Therefore, we see that in the sequence of precipitations we start with G P zones as we noted before later on we obtain the metastable theta prime precipitate then the theta prime precipitate and finally, the equilibrium theta precipitate. And of course, uh, we would note that we do not want to be aging so long that we produce the equilibrium theta precipitate. And uh, now, if you look at a few important points, the first of this is that due to a large surface to volume ratio, the fine precipitate tend to coarsen, that means the small precipitate tend to dissolve and large precipitate tend to grow. And coarsening produces a decrease in number of precipitates with an increase in interparticle spacing, which gives reduced hindrance to dislocation motion. So, these are aspects we have seen before that we want to age such that we do not have a coarse set of precipitates, but we have a fine set of precipitates. That means, we are close to the maximum in the hardness versus time curve or the hardness versus log time curve. Now, uh, what is the crystallography and the interface characteristics of these three precipitates? Uh, we will take that up first before we go to uh, an understanding of why is that we get these metastable phases. One of the reasons we have seen that when even the GP zone comes out the orientation is so chosen that it is the disks diameter is or the disk perpendicular is along the elastically softer direction of the, the aluminum matrix. So, the theta double prime precipitate um, has a unit cell which looks something like this which is like this here which is a distorted FCC and uh, typically the theta double prime is about 10 nanometers thick and about 100 nanometers in diameter and sometimes it can be in the form of a morphology which is shown here on the right hand side and the unit cell composition is about Al 6 Cu 2 that means there are uh, these blue atoms are aluminum the brownish ones are copper. So, for every copper atom there are three aluminum atoms. So, these are the copper atoms and for every copper atom there are three aluminum atoms and these three aluminum atoms are present in these planes which are between the copper atomic plane. So, there are planes which have completely only copper atoms and there are other planes where there are only aluminum atoms and this is a distorted FCC structure and uh, the unit cell composition Al 6 Cu 2 which boils down to Al 3 Cu. Now, this theta double prime precipitate has an orientation relationship with the matrix like the 0 0 1 direction of the theta double prime is parallel to the 0 0 1 direction of the aluminum copper solid solution which is alpha. The 1 0 0 direction of theta double prime is parallel to the 1 0 0 direction of the al aluminum. It is uh, therefore, some important directions are parallel the most uh, uh, simplest ones and if you look at the precipitate typically all phases of this precipitate are coherent. That means, the 1 0 0 phase, the 0 1 0 phase and the 0 0 1 phase all are co coherent with the matrix thus reducing the chemical energy between the theta double prime phase and the aluminum matrix. This implies that the activation barrier for nucleation will be low, but of course, we because of coherency we pay in terms of the strain energy which needs to be supplied while the nucleation takes place. The next phase which comes out is the theta prime phase which is if you look at the morphology looks very similar to the morphology of the, <coughs> the precipitate morphology looks very similar to the theta double prime, but here we have to note that this phase the 1 0 0 and 0 1 0 phases are incoherent and while the 0 0 1 phase may be coherent initially, but as the precipitate grows even this coherent or semi coherent phase becomes incoherent as the precipitate grows. This structure if you look again there are planes of uh, like previously there are planes of aluminum and copper here also there are planes of aluminum and copper. So, these are aluminum planes and there are copper planes between the two. So, I can take this plane in between which contains purely only of copper at a z equal to 1 fourth of the unit cell this is my copper plane. So, there are copper planes in between the aluminum planes and uh, the unit cell composition is Al 4 Cu 2 which means it is equivalent to Al 2 Cu. That means, that 
the prestate theta prime is richer in copper as compared to the prestate theta double prime. And even this theta double theta prime has orientation relationship which is very very similar to that of the theta double prime. That means, the 0 0 1 phase of theta prime is parallel to the 0 0 1 phase of alpha. The 1 0 0 direction of theta prime is parallel to the 1 0 0 direction in alpha. So, the important difference between the two precipitates is that of course, the crystal structure is different, the stoichiometry of, of the phase is also different, but additionally the phases uh, typically the precipitate has mostly incoherent phases, uh, the more, but only one phase which is 0 0 1 starts to out to be coherent, but as the precipitate grows becomes incoherent progressively. The final equilibrium phase which is theta is such that all phases of this theta are incoherent with the matrix. So, therefore, this is the equilibrium theta phase wherein there is no coherency with the matrix. Uh, this is a body centered tetragonal structure. So, we started off with the distorted FCC in the case of theta double prime. The theta prime is an tetragonal structure and now uh, we have a body centered tetragonal structure again uh, having planes which have pure copper like for instance this plane at the top or the bottom plane and there are other planes which have pure aluminum and this is along the 0 0 1 direction. Now, um, this tetragonal body centered structure has 12 atoms per unit cell and the unit cell composition is Al 8 Cu 4 which means it is Al 2 Cu which is very similar or which is identical to the composition we saw for the case of the theta uh, prime. That means, as the prestate goes from theta prime to theta there is no change in the composition and additionally we note that uh, <coughs> both are tetragonal phases that means, there is uh, the overall crystal system does not change. However, all the interfaces now are incoherent and that means that the uh, as we have noted before the in incoherent interfaces are more glissile that means, they can grow faster and therefore, the theta prime prestate tends to coarsen much faster as compared to the theta double prime or the theta prime precipitate and that means, that if you get a even a fine distribution of theta in the matrix, but additional uh, it will tend to coarsen much faster and therefore, you will have a large size theta precipitates if you produce it in the matrix. Now, using Gibbs free energy composition diagrams, let us try to understand that uh, what is the Gibbs free energy benefit when you go from the metastable phase, which is now initially we had the super saturated metastable state, which is only alpha and we are plotting Gibbs free energy versus composition that means, the copper percentage. And of course, we know that we are starting with the mean composition of copper about 4 percent in the aluminum matrix. So, initially of course, we saw that the G p zones come up that means, initially of course, we start with pure alpha that means, there is a single Gibbs free energy alpha curve and the composition of the alloy is say for instance here which is about 4 percent copper. And when G p zones come out its composition is somewhere here and you have to note that we can even think of a some sort of a continuous line Gibbs free energy curve which goes from the alpha to the G p zones. And the concentration of the matrix which is in equilibrium with the G p zones is somewhere here that means, I am in the alpha 1 region. Progressively as you then later on we find the theta double prime phase forms whose Gibbs free energy curve is as shown in the blue curve. And now, by doing a common tangent construction like before first we had done this common tangent construction. Now, we can make a common tangent construction and we can note that now that the composition of the alpha in equilibrium with the theta double prime is now getting poorer in copper in other words richer in aluminum. Then later on we have the theta prime whose Gibbs free energy composition curve is even lower and finally, we have the theta which has the lowest of the Gibbs free energy composition curves that means, overall direction in which the Gibbs free energy is moving is downward and the matrix which is in equilibrium with these is getting richer and richer with respect to you can see here the intersections here by drawing a common tangent construction. So, at each stage you can note that first of course, we start with the Gibbs free energy on the alpha phase which is for the solid solution. Then on forming the G p zones my Gibbs free energy is lower to this point which is G 1. Then further on forming the theta double prime press state my Gibbs free energy is further lowered and further it is lowered when I form the theta prime and finally, when I get to the equilibrium phase I get the lowest free energy. But the important point to note is that of course, at each stage I am seeing a step wise reduction in the Gibbs free energy. The question which we uh, partially answered is that why is that 
that we are getting these metastable phases why do not uh, why does not the theta directly form from the uh, super saturated solid solution. And the reason is that suppose I try to form the theta phase from the alpha phase then the Gibbs free energy barrier the nucleation barrier delta G star is pretty large. Now, this Gibbs free energy barrier can be progressively broken down into small steps that means, now I can by forming GP zones I have to cross a lower nucleation barrier. So, we can think of this lower nucleation barrier as being say for instance delta G 1 star this is a smaller barrier. Then when I form the uh, from the GP zones I form the theta double prime I can think of this barrier being crossed as delta D, D 2 star and from the GP zone uh, theta double prime when I form the theta prime which is another metastable phase I have to cross it again a small barrier which is delta G 3 star. So, at each stage the nucleation barrier is reduced that means that overall activation energy required for my process to take place is small and we have noted that we do this aging not at high temperatures, but typically at low temperatures like 180 degrees Celsius which means that there is not much thermal energy available to cross the activation barrier which implies that that phase can only form for whom I can supply this activation energy. So, in each step you can show that if you plot the total Gibbs free, Gibbs free energy total free energy initially you have a small lowering in the Gibbs free energy when we fall the GP zones then the next step we lower it even further when we form the theta double prime it is lowered even further when you form the theta prime and finally, when from the theta we get down to the lowest equilibrium state. And the overall reduction if you if you had formed from the alpha directly the theta then you would have gotten benefit like this. So, this implies that if the transformation is broken down into a series of step with small activation barriers the process can take place even with low thermal activation. And because this aging is carried out at low temperatures and we have noted that we want to carry out the aging at low temperatures because we want to get uh, be in a regime where there is it is nucleation dominant and the growth is sluggish therefore, we get a lot of nuclei, but each one of these nuclei do not grow very much that means that if I am not going to supply my thermal activation energy the system evolves to a state for which the barrier is small at each step. Now, uh, what we shall do next is that we will try to understand what happens during aging um, using two diagrams one an extended version of the phase diagram which is shown here and other an extended version of the TTT diagram. Now, we have to note that in this phase diagram additional information has been superimposed onto the phase diagram and we should note that which strictly do not belong there. So, we have already seen that sometimes we use diagrams in regions where they are not strictly valid, but then that enhances the utility of these diagrams and we have to keep of course, the assumptions in mind when we are extending the utility of these diagrams. And we have to interpret these diagrams a little bit of care. This diagram shows that on aging at various temperatures the alpha in the alpha plus theta regime the phase diagram various are, are obtained first. That means, that suppose I am aging in this green region of the phase diagram that means, I have now taken my aluminum 4 percent copper I have solutionized it in the single phase field alpha that means, I have now obtained my full single alpha right here. And after that I have quenched to room temperature that means, I have now obtained a super saturated solid solution of copper and aluminum, aluminum and additionally I, as I have pointed out we also land up with a certain excess concentration of vacancies. Now, when I age this in this green regime right here like here any in the one place in the green regime then what will happen is that uh, we obtain GP zones first. And this GP zones as we shall note that will transform later on into theta, theta double prime theta prime into theta if we wait long enough. Instead of aging at these range of temperatures which are noted here suppose I age at a little higher temperature marked in the blue region of the phase field. And again once more we should note that these phase diagrams uh, normally are drawn for equilibrium phases here we are super superimposing metastable uh, precipitates and metastable zones like the GP zones and theta double prime and therefore, we have extended the utility of the standard phase diagram that means, there are no now new metastable phase boundaries and we have to understand this is there just to make us understand that what happens what is the phase which is obtained when we age the metastable solid solution. In the blue region we obtain we do not obtain GP zones first we directly obtain 
theta double prime. Now, if you age at even higher temperatures like in the regime marked here in the brownish color. So, we note that in this regime of temperatures we would actually get theta prime directly that means, we would not get GP zones we will not get theta double prime, but we will get theta prime directly and this further can now transform into theta if you wait long enough. At even higher temperatures directly we get the equilibrium phase theta and these theta typically nucleate on the green boundaries. So, now additionally apart from the original solvus line which is this the normal solvus line we have various solvus lines like the G p zone solvus line here for instance this is the G p zone solvus line. Similarly, we can theta think of the theta double prime solvus line and the theta prime solvus line. So, normally of course, we, ha we have to age in the low temperatures say typically less than about 200 degree Celsius. So, that we start with G p zones and a fine distribution of G p zones. So, that we can get a good hindrance to dislocation motion. Now, like we have done here we have superimposed uh, uh, all the metastable phases in the phase diagram. What we do here is that uh, the left hand portion shows the phase diagram and we are after a composition of about 4 percent copper and uh, these are all the various metastable solvers lines which we saw just now in the phase diagram and the right hand side are TTT curves which show what happens when we age. And please note in each case the starting point is of course, the And if you low age at low temperatures, suppose you are tracking along the A line, A dotted line. First, initially we have from the alpha transforms to we get GP zones. On waiting long enough, we get of course again log is the x log time is the x axis. We get the theta prime, so we cross the theta prime line, theta double prime line. Then of course we get theta prime, and if you wait even longer, then you will cross the theta line. If however you age at higher temperature and you start off at a point B then directly you will obtain the theta double prime from the alpha solid solution and this theta double prime if you wait long enough will transform to theta prime and further to theta. On aging at even higher temperatures, so in this regime here you will of course, start with alpha, alpha will tra directly transform to theta prime and then to theta when you cross the line here. So, there are two crossing points at which these um, alpha will transform first to theta prime and then to theta at even higher temperatures between the um, theta prime solvers and the actual solvers line of the phase diagram. If you age along a line for instance, so this is C and if you age along D then directly you will obtain the equilibrium theta phase. So, now the transformation sequence can now be understood in terms of an extended TT diagram in which not only you have transformation to one phase but progressive transformation to other phases. Previously we saw that of course, in the case of steels we had drawn a line in which for instance the gamma phase would transform into alpha plus Fe 3 C. Of course, we had drawn the start line and the finish line, but here we are seeing a sequence of transformations and um, these are drawn with different kind of TT curves. So, there is one curve for transformation of alpha for instance aging along A, we have one curve for transformation of alpha to uh, the orange curve from alpha to theta double prime and after transformation to theta double prime we have one more blue curve for transformation of theta double prime to theta and then from theta prime uh, theta. So, this is theta prime here from theta prime to theta etcetera. So, sorry this is alpha to G p zone. So, you have G p zone here and G p zones to theta double prime here theta double prime to theta prime and finally, whenever you intersect this curve this extrapolated curve here then you will note that you get the equilibrium theta prime, theta phase. So, now using our usual phase diagrams which have been extended and the concept simple concept of activation energy and extended versions of TTT diagrams we can see that how instead of obtaining when you age at low temperature instead of obtaining the equilibrium theta phase directly we are obtaining a series of metastable phases. And uh, depending on the temperature at which you age, uh, you may get the complete sequence starting from the super saturated alpha to theta or you may start directly with one of the other metastable phases like theta double prime or in the extreme uh, example, if you just age it at 
below the stable solvers line you may directly get the theta phase. So, the aging temperature matters uh, because that will decide how much activation energy is available for the system to adopt a kind of a structure which though may be metastable, but gives you a benefit in terms of the activation energy. This frustration hardening uh, process is industrially very relevant and uh, can be found in a variety of systems which are frustration hardenable and you have noted the common characteristics among all that we have a sloping solvus line that means that we can quench from high temperature to produce a super saturated solid solution which can be aged to produce a series of uh, uh, zones and precipitates and uh, and the common ones which are found some these are not the exhaustive examples but a few examples there are aluminum based alloys there are uh, copper based alloys iron based alloys and nickel based alloys which are age hardenable now uh, the aluminum silver system for instance we have the prestation sequence consisting of gp zones followed by gamma prime plates followed by gamma the prime in all these cases denotes the fact that you are obtaining a metastable phase like for instance this is a metastable phase here in this case we already seen theta double prime denotes a metastable phase the gamma prime in the case of the copper beryllium system again denotes the fact that we are obtaining a metastable phase in between. Uh, the prestation sequence in some of these alloys is very very similar though in some cases we get gp zones to one metastable phase to finally, the stable phase and we do not get two intermediate metastable phases. The morphologies again change from system to system for instance in the case of the aluminum silver system we start with spheres that which and but the gamma prime are the plates and in the case of the aluminum copper system you already seen discs followed by plates uh, uh, we had of course schematically shown the theta double prime as a plate here but the morphology could be more like a disc but which have incoherent uh, which all have coherent phases uh, in the aluminum copper magnesium systems uh, we could have rods or laths and finally, of course, the stable phase themselves are lats. In it other systems for instance, you could uh, use actually the metastable state as the final state for the hardened system for instance, nickel chromium titanium alloy aluminum alloy you could use the gamma prime phase which are in the form of cubes or spheres which have a low interfacial energy which can be used for uh, prestation hardening. Now, therefore, we have a variety of systems which are prestation hardenable and uh, in all these cases the fundamental mechanisms remains the same that these fine distribution of precipitates or zones give a hindrance to dislocation motion and uh, they come in two forms one of course, that uh, your precipitate has to be sheared which gives a certain benefit that means, you have to um, drive the dislocation through the precipitate wherever they are coherent and the pearl stress inside the precipitate could be higher and wherever the precipitates are incoherent then we have to operate a uh, uh, Frank's double end source mechanism or uh, the dislocation has to loop around the precipitates thus the precipitates act like pinning points giving rise to hardening. And we have already of course, noted that these two hardening effects based on the radius could be have a different kind of functionality. The particle shearing mechanism increases with size while the particle bypass mechanism the stress required decreases with size, because if when you have the constant volume fraction of precipitate and the precipitate size is increasing their inter precipitate distance is going to also increase. Now, we had noted one more point when we pointed out that uh, about the shape of the hardness versus aging time curve and we had noted that we had drawn a hardness versus aging time curve which looks like the one on the right hand side the one I am highlighting now in yellow. So, it looks something like this, but in reality hardening curves. Uh, depend on the temperature of aging for instance here I have considered two aging temperatures 130 degrees Celsius or 190 degrees Celsius. It also depends on the percentage of copper in the alloy for instance there are 2 percent copper alloys there is 3 percent copper alloys 4 percent copper alloys and the uh, 4.5 percent copper alloys. So, now therefore, there are lot of details involved in the actual hardening curves that means the hardness obtained uh, versus the time of aging and the time of aging here of course, is shown in days and these are actual uh, sort of curves which you would obtain when you actually age it rather than the schematic which we had considered before. So, this schematic which we drew before can be thought of as in some kind of a master curve which is obtained and this is overall to understand that the hardness increases 
but if you age too long then the hardness decreases. So, depending on the copper percentage and depending on the aging temperature the nature of the hardening, hardening curve changes. Additionally these graphs also contain different curves to show what is the predominant phase present. It of course, does not mean that the whole system is exactly that, but what is the predominant phase present. For instance, if you look at a 4.5 percent copper alloy which is on the left hand side diagram the, the one aged at 130 degrees Celsius initially the hardness changes is due to the presence of GP zones and GP zones persist till about here. But later on when you change the you wait even longer then the phase transforms to theta double prime and which I am highlighting in slightly orangish color and the theta double prime persists even beyond the peak hardness. But even before my entire theta double prime has changed to uh, there is also parallelly a process in which you are obtaining theta prime phase also. So, along the same line you can notice that there is a dotted line here which shows that there is theta prime phase also coming out. So, as I pointed out before that the overall aging sequence is rather complex wherein we are monitoring three parameters. One is of course, the size and their uh, size of the press states and their inter press state distance. We are monitoring the crystallography of the press state is it cubic tetragonal or is it just a zone. We are also monitoring the morphology or the characteristics of the interface that means, is the interface coherent, semi coherent or incoherent. So, G p zones are coherent theta double prime we noted is coherent, but theta prime is only partly coherent which also may become incoherent while theta is fully incoherent. Therefore, putting together all these pictures we see that the aging curves become rather complex. So, if you look at the aging curve for for instance uh, aluminum 4 percent copper alloy and which is aged at 130 degrees Celsius you would note that again there is a hardness curve which varies very strangely. That means, there is one peak some sort of a plateau followed by a peak and all along the while initially G p zones are there then they transform after a certain time into there is a combination of theta double prime and theta and finally, of course, you age too long you land up with theta prime and if you wait even longer then of course, you will get full theta press state. But our goal would be to age only to peak hardness that means, we would try to reach somewhere here if you are talking about 4.5 percent copper alloy or you would age to here to get with a 4 percent copper alloy. And if you take a low copper percentage alloy you see that this kind of a sequence wherein you get a plateau is missing and you land up with a single peak in the aging curve. On the other hand suppose you age at a slightly higher temperatures like 190 degree we get our classic single peak curve. Uh, single uh, maxima and uh, this is true for all the percentage of copper like 2 percent, 3 percent etcetera. But the important point to note that suppose I start with a 190 degrees and start with a 4.5 percent copper alloy I directly obtain the theta prime press state which finally, transforms into uh, sorry the theta double prime which transforms into theta prime towards this end. So, now what is present at the starting of this is here is directly theta double prime which comes out and when I land up here I land up at this point theta prime. On the other hand suppose I am aging a copper 2 percent uh, aluminum 2 percent alloy then I directly start with theta theta prime even though I am aging at 190 degree Celsius which is a low enough temperature for me to give for instance. That means, the TTD curves are changed such that you directly intersect the uh, alpha line with the theta prime line and therefore, you get directly theta prime. Now, um, if you are aging a 3 percent aluminum cop aluminum copper alloy with copper 3 percent then there is a small range of times when you actually obtain a theta double prime, but then later on throughout most of the curve you are actually obtaining the theta prime precipitate. So, let us note the salient the variables the variables are percentage of copper and the temperature at which you are aging if you are aging at low temperature and with high percentages of copper the overall aging sequence consists of more features like uh, one peak followed by a plateau followed by another peak rather than the simple single peak picture. Aging at lower higher temperatures like 190 degree Celsius gives us the sort of the schematic single peak curve, but then 
the details are hidden in the percentage copper we are um, aging. So, the points to be noted which I summarized below are in low temperature aging for instance 130 degrees Celsius, the average the aging curves have more detail than the single peak curve discussed schematically before. In aging at 130 degrees Celsius, the full sequence of precipitation is observed that means GP zones giving theta double prime giving rise to theta prime. Um, now, at high temperatures 190 degrees Celsius, theta prime directly theta double prime directly forms that means, the full precipitation sequence is not observed peak hardness increases with increasing copper percentage. For the same copper percentage the peak hardness is lower for the 190 degrees aging treatment as compared to the 130 degrees aging treatment. That means, that uh, if you maintain a constant copper percentage it is better to age at lower uh, temperature, but then we already noted that we have to wait for longer times to get the peak hardness. For instance, now uh, if I am working with uh, say 2 percent copper or let me take 3 percent copper for 3 percent copper to get peak age I would wait something between about 10 days and about 100 days somewhere here. But if I am working at higher temperature I can get with 3 percent copper alloy the same peak hardness not the same, but the peak hardness between less than 10 days, but overall the peak hardness value is of course, lower when I this value is lower than this value. So, this value is about say for instance 70 Vickers pyramid number and this value is about 100 because pyramid number. So, aging is at lower temperature is better because we get a peak, uh, better peak hardness, but then we have to wait for a longer time. So, the peak hardness achieved when the microstructure consists of theta prime or a combination of theta prime plus theta double prime. So, this is uh, uh, typically where the peak lies in some of these curves. So, this is a typical observation from studying these hardness versus aging diagrams. So, we are in a position to summarize whatever you led about uh, studied about persuasion hardening by using a sequence of heat treatments which involve solutionizing, quenching and aging and knowing about the fact that where the peak in the nucleation rate lies, what is the barrier to nucleation <coughs> and we can actually engineer these heat treatments to get a fine distribution of precipitates in a say for instance the aluminum matrix. The overall goal of course, as we noted before is to increase the strength of aluminum to high values because aluminum is a fantastic structural material due to its other properties. For instance, it forms a tough adherent oxide which gives it good corrosion resistance. It has got a pleasing color metallic finish and by doing this heat treatment I can actually improve the strength of aluminum which can give it good structural applications. In engineering these uh, heat treatments we are also engineering the microstructure that means, we are getting for instance the GP zones which have for instance uh, a certain distribution in the matrix which have their strain fields and these GP zones or the for instance even the metastable theta double prime phase etcetera give a hindrance to dislocation motion and by, by getting a fine distribution of these precipitates or the metastable phases we can actually engineer the microstructure. So, therefore, so far we have seen that we can actually engineer the microstructure to control the properties. One point we noted is that if the precipitate scores in that means, that if the overall precipitate size increases while the number of precipitates decrease with time then the hardness of the alloy decreases. That means, we want to retain a fine distribution of precipitates and we want to avoid coarsening. What is the method to avoid coarsening is that uh, we can either use a precipitate which has a low uh, gamma that means, there are three strategies which we can use to uh, avoid the coarsening of precipitate which is especially true if your alloy is used at high in high temperature applications where the coarsening chances are very large. Then we can use either a low interfacial energy between the precipitate and the matrix to reduce uh, uh, the coarsening rate. We can use a, an alloy for which the diffusivity is very very small or we can use an equilibrium concentration which is in uh, of the solute which is in equilibrium with the precipitate to be very very small. So, we will just discuss the first of these three strategies, so that uh, we understand that how a low interfacial energy can help in reducing the coarsening. Uh, in mnemonic alloys for instance, the nickel chromium plus aluminum and titanium alloys, the strength is obtained by a fine dispersion of gamma prime precipitates, which is an ordered FCC and which is having a chemical formula Ni 3 T i A L in a nickel, which is an FCC rich matrix. 
Now, the nickel gamma prime matrix or the nickel solid solution which is having a matrix of gamma prime uh, has a very low interfacial energy of the order of about 30 milli joule per meter square. And uh, because of this uh, you find that this alloy it can be applied in high temperature applications and can withstand long service hours at high temperatures without the precipitate coarsening. Therefore, <coughs> uh, let me first draw the picture of what is meant by this uh, starting and end point. So, suppose you had these precipitates and now suppose you have a combination of these coherent precipitates and if you land up with the final state which is a few large precipitates then this is not a good news for the alloy of course. <coughs> but on the other hand suppose you are able to avoid this coarsening wherein and during coarsening we have to note that the overall volume fraction of the prestate does not increase, but it is only the number of prestates that means now in this whole process the volume to surface area this ratio decreases and this is the driving force for this uh, coarsening process. Therefore, we do not want this coarsening and to avoid this coarsening one of the strategies is to use a low interfacial energy between the precipitate and the matrix and this is especially true if your application involves high temperatures for the alloy. So, we have noted that um, we can obtain a fine distribution of these precipitates and further by choosing an appropriate precipitate which has a low interfacial energy we can avoid coarsening and the alloy can be kept in a fine scale for a fine scale of precipitates for a long time. Next we take another example wherein we do the microstructure engineering, but in this case of course, we are doing microstructure engineering not on a crystalline material, but on a glass. And what is glass of course, we have already noted is a disordered state of matter based on atomic structure therefore, there is no unit cell and there is we cannot use this uh, <coughs> standard tools of crystallography on glasses. Now, how do we form glass? It is easy to form glasses in uh, inorganic materials like silicate glasses. For instance, suppose I take my window pane glass which is silicate glass, you can actually slowly cool the glass and form a amorphous structure or a glassy structure or a disordered structure. And the reason being that in uh, silicates uh, the enthalpy of fusion is low and the overall viscosity is also high. So, you have a high viscosity melt which slowly cooled can give you a glass. On the other hand it is actually difficult uh, and that means that uh, silicates are easily amorphized. On the other hand you would note that if I have metals which have an high enthalpy of fusion and which have a low viscosity such cases it is actually difficult to amorphize standard metals like aluminum and simple alloys li like aluminum copper alloys. On the other hand, other hand there are special metallic compositions. Uh, which are based on zirconium and other they usually contain many many alloying elements such uh, typically ternaries, quaternaries and higher number of alloying elements and such alloys are can have a low critical cooling rate that means they can also be cooled considerably slower than for instance the cooling rate required to amorphize for instance aluminum or some simple alloys. So, there are comp special compositions of metals which also can be amorphized by reasonably slow cooling rates. However, if you want to amorphize uh, metals you may have to sometime employ very high cooling rates and which are achieved as we saw by a process like melt spinning and splat quenching. Now, the important point to note of course, is that suppose I have an amorphous ceramic can I use my TT diagram and the knowledge therein to engineer my microstructure to obtain a set of properties which are normally not found in the glass or in the pure ceramic. So, glass being the disordered state ceramic being referred to the crystalline state. Now, before we even go to that we have noted that uh, typically a fine grain size bestows superior mechanical properties to the material. Um, a high nucleation rate and a slow growth, growth rate gives you a fine grain size and this of course, we are talking about a normal solidification process for instance. We have already noted that the peak of the uh, growth rate curves light, uh, lies at higher temperatures as compared to the peak of the nucleation rates and we want to use this knowledge to actually produce a fine crystallite size. So, how do we do this for the case of a glass ceramic? The problem with 
or the beautiful thing about glasses is that um, these glasses are easier to shape. For instance, when you might have seen in glass blowing that we can actually take a glass, heat it up and actually blow it to various shapes. So, it is easier to actually uh, shape glasses to any desired geometry unlike the ceramics. On the other hand, these glasses have a poor thermal spalling resistance. This thermal spalling resistance comes from the fact that suppose I have a material for instance, which I suppose there is a material or a crucible made of glass and I take it to high temperature and cool it in water quench it. That means, first I heat it followed by quench. Now, what happens is that the outer surface will feel the cooling medium, the for instance the inner surface may not feel and therefore, across the cross section there is a temperature gradient and therefore, the outer uh, region will contract first while the inner region will not and therefore, due to differential thermal expansion or in this case differential thermal contraction you would note that there are thermal stresses generated and this material having poor fracture toughness can lead to fracture of or spalling of this material. That means, and if a material has a ability to withstand differential thermal uh, thermal stress or stresses arising from differential thermal expansion such a material is said to have good spalling resistance. So, typically these uh, glasses uh, do not have a good spalling resistance and we want to improve that. For instance, suppose I would like to have a cookware which I can put on a flame directly and cook and if it is a nice transparent uh, material it may also help in the process I mean it may you can directly see the material being cooked. But we have noted that we now need to engineer the microstructure so that we can endow certain amount of spalling resistance to the glass. So, the way it is done is that we add heterogeneous nucleating agents like TiO2 to the molten glass or the fused glass. Of course, glass you know is a amorphous material that means it does not show a distinct melting point. Then we shape the material in the glassy state which is good because now the glasses are easily shaped into the desired geometry. Then we prestate the TiO2 as fine particles that means we work at a low temperatures where you get a high nucleation rate, but a small growth rate then we that means, we hold it at a high nucleation after prestating the point particles, we hold it at a temperature where the nucleation rate is high, then slowly we heat it to a temperature where the growth rate is maximum. So, the overall heat treatment process consists of you have a glass, then we cause nucleation, then we cause further growth and then finally, we have a partially crystallized glass. So, the micro final microstructure consists of uh, crystals embedded in glass that means, the final product is not fully crystalline. See typically crystallite size is of the order of about 0.1 micrometer and uh, this is much smaller than the typical grain size in a metal that means, we have not allowed the crystals to grow too much during the growth phase. So, we are holding it at a higher temperature where the maximum of growth rate lies, but still we are not allowing these nuclei which are formed at lower temperature to grow to a large size that means, we typically land up with a small crystallite size of about 0.1 micrometer and the final microstructure consists of these crystals embedded in a glassy, glassy matrix. So, you have a glassy matrix in which you have these fine distribution of crystallites. And this final product we have obtained which is a actually a composite of um, crystals and glass on has got good thermal shock resistance and has got otherwise also good mechanical properties. Uh, there is a commercially available product which is called pyrocerad which can directly be heated on the flame and this is the advantage of having such a glass ceramic. So, to summarize the part we have done so far that we have two distinct levels of control over the properties. One is by what we call at the crystal structure level, one is at the microstructure level and we have defined microstructure to be the combination of phases, defects, residual stress state and their distributions and therefore, I can do microstructure engineering to get a direct handle on the properties. We have seen how the hardness, the tensile strength etcetera changes when you are talking about steels. We have seen that how the strength of aluminum alloys can be changed by microstructure engineering. 
and here in this example we have seen that even a glass can be uh, a starting glass can be engineered uh, by producing a fine distribution of crystallites to give a combination of not only um, for instance easy formability, but also <coughs> good uh, resistance to spalling. So, let me summarize the final things we have done in the case of the glass ceramic that we of course, we have noted that silicate glasses easily form glass by even slow cooling because of their high enthalpy of fusion and a very high viscosity I mean enth sorry a low enthalpy of fusion and a high viscosity they are easily amorphized. Um, that means, that in contrast to metals silicates, borates and phosphates tend to form glasses easily um, and they typically have tend to have open structures. And once I have this glass it can be shaped easily to the desired geometry then by using a series of steps in which I for instance add some titania um, which can then be used as a nucleating agent to produce a fine distribution of crystallites. And these fine crystallites can further of course, uh, the volume fraction of these crystallites can be increased by using a growth step at higher temperature where the maximum of the growth rate lies we can obtain a final microstructure which is a composite of glass and ceramic. So, this final microstructure uh, is good against spalling resistance and a cookware made out of uh, such a glass can directly be kept on the flame and heated. So, that this is a advantage as you know typically you notice that metals uh, have this property that they can easily be directly heated on flame, but in this case we are noting that even a ceramic which is uh, typically it does not have a good spalling resistance can be heated on flame and you can do cooking directly in a ceramic vessel which has been kept on a uh, some kind of a thermal resistance heating system or even a gas system. So, we have noted that we can actually do what we might call use our knowledge of phase transformations, phase equilibria and TTT diagrams to engineer microstructures to get a series of properties which are not available if we did not have a knowledge of these tools.